But what it really comes down to is, you know, we want to know what an individual's carbohydrate tolerance is, okay? I mean, that's key to personalization, right? Does everybody need to be very low carbohydrate, low carbohydrate? I mean, where does, we can say population level, what happens in large clinical trials, but what's happening with the individual? Because let's face it, Peter, and you know, you and I as practicing clinicians know this, when you're sitting with one patient in front of you, you can go over group data from a clinical trial. And that's important part of the decision making, but the only thing that really matters is what's gonna happen with the patient right in front of you. We really wanna know what the individualized reaction is gonna be. You know, we know that this happens with a carbohydrate consumption above a certain threshold, but what that certain threshold is in the individual, we don't know. And based on these pathways, you know, what is the marker we want to be looking at? Actually, it's probably POA, surprisingly not a fatty acid. But what this tells us is that when someone has consumed carbohydrates above their individual tolerance, that POA level is going to be a great biomarker. It's going to go up as again, a protective mechanism in the liver. Our livers are really, I mean, you know, we talk about livers all the time, so related to insulin resistance. It's just always amazing just how sophisticated and how our livers, although we think of them as producing things that aren't necessarily good for us, and that may be true, they're also really working for us as well. Um, and so again, I want to also go back on one other thing that you said. Um, and the other thing that you said is, so this comes, you know, before the adiposity. And I think that that is such an important point and one I like to preach every opportunity I can get it. But this is starting to happen before people gain a lot of weight. Okay, this is a disease process in and of itself that causes obesity. So, you know, we have to really take that into account when we're in the office with someone who's struggling for uh, with obesity. And I know, Peter, you take this really to heart of approaching and treating these patients without bias, um, and, and as I do. But it's, it's so important for other providers to be looking themselves in the mirror and asking themselves, you know, what are the biases I hold? Um, against patients who come to me struggling with their weight? Um, and what do I really know about the science? And what it really, one must conclude is that this is not their fault, okay? These are things that happened beforehand and they're suffering the consequences of it. And the problem is the consequence is on full view for everyone to see. It's not something that they can hide. And that makes them so vulnerable to bias in healthcare. And again, one of the other things I come back to is part of our whole battle in health equity. So Sarah, I want to keep digging into this idea because it's so interesting to me of having a leading indicator for you know this early, early, early warning sign. You know, I mean, I we talked about it at the outset of this discussion, which is you know, in some ways the tragedy of using hemoglobin A1C as the marker of when somebody gets on the radar. I mean, you said it yourself, patients will show up and nobody's ringing the bell until their hemoglobin A1C is above 6.5. But I mean, that literally is happening 10, 15, maybe 20 years after there were early, early molecular warning signs. And if measuring palmitoleic acid is one of them, uh, that's exactly the kind of stuff that I find interesting because in our practice, we use CGM a lot. So continuous glucose monitoring is kind of, you know, we don't, you know, non-diabetics are wearing CGM like it's no tomorrow in our practice. 
because of that exact reason. We're basically holding them to a very high standard of average glucose and high excursions and all these sorts of things. I want to go back to something that you alluded to, which is the association between palmitic, palmitoleic acid and triglyceride is so tight that would we miss, for example, African-American patients? Do we know if they are failing to synthesize C C16-1 in the way a white patient is? Wouldn't we love to know that? There's not been a good trial looking at that. I mean, one of the problems that we have in research in general is that we tend to focus on white people, right? Um, you know, and actually worse middle or upper middle class white people. Um, so there are a lot of questions with this um, in specific populations. Um, there have been a couple of studies recently coming out looking specifically at what we're talking about, POA, um, uh, and its marker for future problems and predictor of future diabetes and other issues. Um, one was a study recently published called the PANIC study, looking at levels in childhood and seeing how they translate to health consequences, you know, decades down the road. And then there was another study, I believe it was from the Netherlands, um, where they looked at POA levels at 50 to correlate them with C-reactive protein levels at age 70, right? And what we see is what we would expect based on our, our discussion here, which is the POA was a predictor of problems down the road in people who were healthy when their POA was elevated or healthy, so we thought. You know, what we really wanna know ahead of time, and I know this is very meaningful to you in your practice is, I want the person who's healthy so I can get to, to tell them how to stay healthy, okay? We, we talk a lot about, you know, trying to work on people who are already, so, so to speak, behind the eight ball and we want to work them out and we want to regress their disease, clearly an important goal. But we also really, if we're going to make a difference, again, with the individual and population-wide, we need to know who's headed for trouble. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit Peter Atia, MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.